Please listen carefully. All right, so uh, we got Ryan Sampson here. Every time I uh, either do or instruct a class to do Sampson Stretch, I always think of you. So you are <laughs> Thanks, constantly at top of mind uh, pretty much every other day. Um, why don't you give a little bit of background as to maybe where you grew up, like kind of like you know, childhood upbringing and okay. all that, and maybe how you got into CrossFit, because that's obviously, obviously how we met. Right. Yeah. Um, I grew up right down the road, actually. Uh, North Wales has been my home, Telford, like, but yeah, moved to North Wales when I was eight. Um, it's where my parents still live, my family still is. Um, went to Abington Friends School, had a great experience mm. there, still work for them from time to time. Uh, let's see, I went to the University of Pittsburgh. That's mm -hmm. where not just fell in love with photography, that's my job when we're not in COVID protocol. <laughs> <laughs> Did you go to school for photography or was that you went to school for something else or not sure and then you fell into it? So I started, I love science. I, I nerd out about it, but Pitt, uh, the undergrad there is spectacular for pre-med and yep. I got weeded out real hard. You know, I, <laughs> I had a lot of friends who partied too much and didn't, like I didn't touch any of that stuff. I just wasn't great at taking their standardized tests. And got it. I love history, even like anything else, like I can sit down and hmm. nerd out and watch, read, listen to any of that stuff. And I was like, what can I do to stay in the University of Pittsburgh, which is a great school. Uh, and I just went right into the history field and that's what my degree is hmm. in. But that Maybe said, um, I've always loved athletics, whether we're talking watching sports, playing sports, uh, got into karate at a young age, won a few national championships, which I always love to bring up and brag about. Seriously. But I was, yeah, I was oh, like yeah. 13, so it, yeah. I mean, it is what it is. And hey, man, I, it's more than me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, then, uh, so going to college. Oh, okay, I'll backtrack a little bit. So at Abington Friends, you have to play a sport. And I wasn't good enough to make the varsity soccer team. I was pretty undersized. I was just kind of burned out by all that. But I took up a photography course because you have to take mm. a art at Abington Friends School. Mm. And I didn't love drawing or painting and so I was like I've always had a DSLR my dad nerds out about camera stuff and uh, I took that and I fell in love with it hmm. and I really just gravitated towards action um, so I started taking photos of all my friends in the sports teams uh, Abington Friends makes you do a senior independent project at the end and or at the end of your senior year and so I did my sip with the man who ended up actually being my mentor uh, his name's Greg Crocio. Uh he to this day still does Villanova, St. Joe's, LaSalle, oh, cool. uh, Philadelphia Union. Yeah. Uh, so I mentored under him mm -hmm. and then went to Pitt, continued my love of sports, found that the best seat in the house was working for the Pitt News. And we had some amazing basketball teams back then, like Juwan Blair, oh, yeah. uh, a few number one teams, of course, Villanova mm -hmm. knocked us out. So yep. still a little bitter about Plenty that. Plenty of good rivalry back then. Yep. <laughs> it's right, yep. it's somewhat dwindled out, although Pitt's recovering <laughs> a little bit. We're still not Villanova. <laughs> But uh, so yeah, then after I graduated from Pitt uh, with a degree in history, I talked again to my mentor and he needed some help and uh, been doing that pretty much ever since. And it's, it's fun. It's a, definitely a rewarding job. It's mm -hmm. got moments where it's cold as hell and you're wet, but it's, uh, it's a good time. And then while I was at Pitt, uh, one of my buddies, I was eating way too much pizza, drinking too much beer, mm -hmm. and I was getting a little tubby. And so one of my best friends had just started the Panther CrossFit Club. Mm -hmm. And so my junior year, I started going into that. And I always had this idea of the gym guys being these, these kind of stupid jocks, right? Yep. Like just yep. guys who just go in there, like to lift heavy things and totally. put them down. And my first experience there was fight going bad. And most that of that- is quite a workout right? to start. Most sense. of that was because of our lack of gear. Mm. Um, so, did that, fell in love with it, realized the guys were actually really intelligent. And I think that was like one of the eye-opening things in CrossFit for me, where it was like, these aren't just jocks. Like there's a science behind this. It's really yep. cool, it's skill-based. Yep. It's not just overall strength, albeit yep. they were monsters. Yep. Um, and yeah, so I started Panther CrossFit. Uh, I remember trying to clean a PVC pipe and just <laughs> being furious, because I couldn't <laughs> figure out how to squat under it. Yep. Um, but yeah. So then, let's back up. So because yep, the, uh, the, the former high school counselor in me is curious, when you right. were at Abington, <laughs> yep. um, how many kids did you graduate with? 68. 
So you, you were living in North Wales, so it meant if you went public, you would have gone to North, North Penn, Penn with 3,000 per class. Yep. Or sorry, 1,000 per class. But 3,000. But 3,000 overall, because right. they only go 10, 11, 12. Yep. And instead you chose to go to a small school. Yep. So talk to me about that decision, and then also talk to me about, do you feel like that decision shaped you into a person that you otherwise wouldn't have become or would have done differently if you went to a big high school? Right. Uh, for me, so I started at Germantown Academy, um, mm -hmm. and I have a reading deficiency where mm -hmm. it's not dyslexia, but it, it's similar. Got it. Um, I, my parents pulled me and threw me into North Penn from third grade to sixth grade, and that's when mm. we realized that the North Penn School District uh, was awesome at getting me back to the reading level that I needed to be at, mm -hmm. but that Abington Friends was a much better place for me as far as not just what, how I learn, mm. um, because mm -hmm. they tend to give you a lot more freedom with the way they educate you. Um, and I flourished in that situation. Cool. That said, I, you know, high school is hard on almost everybody, even right. if you have a great experience. Yep. And I realized that whether it was the lack of other friends and student body or just everybody knowing each other's business, I was mm -hmm. so sick and tired of that small school environment. And so when it came so to- So you were thinking, ready to go across the I state. I was done. Yep. Yeah. Got it. So I drew like a five hour circle around my mm -hmm. the house that I yep. grew up in yep. and Pitt just so happened to fall into that bracket. Technically in state, but- as far in state as you can pretty much go without going up to like Erie. Right. Yeah. Okay. So you're basically driving through an entire different state anyway when yep. you get out there. Yeah. Um, I love Pittsburgh to this day. Yeah. Um, it's a fantastic small city that's completely reinvented itself. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So when you were at Pitt, you went in for pre med. Uh, yes, definitely known for their sciences for sure. Yep. Um, but obviously, uh, they probably structure it in a way to make people weed themselves out, Correct. right? And that um, was very effective for me. Yeah, which, hey, look, like if it's <laughs> then versus like getting into med school and then suddenly realizing it's not for you, like right. better to do it then, right? So when you're there, you decide to go to history. Yep. When is that, freshman year? Yep, end of my freshman year. Okay. I started taking classes. I knew I could But mostly yet. because you wanted to stay at Pitt. Yep. Because you already made friends there. Yep. And you were also like, well, what am I just naturally interested in? Right. But photography never, either that maybe they didn't offer it or it just never it was not one came of those, up as an option. Yeah, it, ju it just, it was something that I always did as a passion. Okay, um, got it. But never really thought that I could make money through it. Gotcha. Um, mostly because how I got the gig with Greg was a lot of luck. Got um, it. And I just wanted to kind of cross those other bases first. Okay, um, so you come out with a history degree. Yep. So what's your plan coming out senior year? You're like, you graduate, yep. you probably have friends that already have jobs lined up. Yep, a lot so, of engineers I, I associated with the smart kids. Yeah, so life. they already had in, in, yep. internships junior year that they then, you know, right. go and I started college as an engineer. So yeah, yeah. fully familiar with that. <laughs> um, so what was your, was your plan to come back and talk with Greg, Greg about um, helping him out? I had sent him some of my work throughout that time period, so we kept in touch, okay. and I knew how much his business had grown in that period too. Yeah. Um, and he, I think the biggest difference was he had three kids under the age of like five at the time. Mm. And so he was just like, this is far too much work for me. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, that's just kind of how that developed. And then I gotcha. interned under him, and then part of my paycheck would actually go to paying off gear, which is how I was able to gotcha. go into the sports photography market because if you guys know anything about cameras it is a steep slope to get anything worth shooting with so. high barrier to entry obviously once you have the glass right. you know within the bodies it's you know lower maintenance right. over time but right. yeah um, especially for sports photography where you're dealing with larger you know more telescopic lenses versus uh, right. you know maybe portrait photography yep yeah so it's it's uh, the gear is awesome like just nerding out about that stuff all day yeah for um, sure yeah <laughs> so you graduate, you're helping them out, and yep. then at some point you're just basically like, look, I'm gonna make this my career. Yep. Um, and so you're shooting for, what, mostly colleges? Yep. And mostly some professional teams? Uh, Philadelphia Union is the main one. I've shot the Flyers a time or two, but like nothing yep. crazy. Um, yeah, it's uh, when we're not in COVID protocol and most colleges <laughs> are looking to actually have sports being played. Yep. Um, but yeah, it just completely blew up the entire sports scene and it's still struggling to recover. Um, you have basketball and football are the two main ones that bring in money. So obviously we're okay. pushing mm -hmm. those programs through, but as far as like spring athletics are concerned, they're really struggling. And, uh, 
hopefully, you know, fingers crossed when the vaccine starts getting mm -hmm. more distributed. Yep. But until then, it's just everybody kind of treading water and holding their breath. As now, we, yeah. when they hire you, are you working for the university uh, as, a, as an employee or are you hired as a contractor? I am a subcontractor. Okay. Um, so, so you're 1099. Correct. Yeah. Which is not preferable, but I mean, right, welcome right. to the photography world. We don't get to yep. make a lot of our own rules unless it's your yep. contract. Yeah. So even though you might be consistent, it's, it's pretty much like you're a freelancer Correct. waiting for people to tap you on the shoulder and, yep. and bring and you And then in. you go. Um, okay. There were quite a few years we had the Ivy League contract and that was awesome because they would send me up on mm. weekends and I would just spend the entire weekend at Brown and then you know, drive down to Harvard. Pen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so it, that, gotcha. that was fun. Tons of work. I mean, we're talking like 50,000 photos taken in a two day span. Holy smokes. And then you have to go through and you don't edit them all necessarily, but you right. make sure that the action's good and that yep. uh, the photos are in focus, yep. which was something like swimming and diving is like every third one. Yep. Um, but yeah, I've shot everything from, you know, swimming, diving, fencing, football, you know, basketball is probably the big one in Philadelphia because our basketball mm -hmm. is just so awesome. What's uh, your favorite? Uh, I really enjoy soccer. That's mm -hmm. what I grew up playing. Mm -hmm. um, and just having the Philadelphia Union contract is mm -hmm. awesome. Yep. Um, but I, I, hmm, CrossFit's like a weird spot for me with photography because lifting's kind of boring, if we're completely honest. Mm -hmm. So if you can make CrossFit interesting, that mm -hmm. it actually catches the eye and makes somebody want to do it. Yep. But then you're also portraying somebody at their best, yep. which is tough because in a lot of times, like we're making derp faces. You know, yep. there's that 5% of the population <laughs> that can look good doing anything. And yeah, veins are looks, popping out everywhere. Yep. Looks like you're on the toilet. Like, right. Yeah. Just. <laughs> and then everybody else just looks ridiculous. So yep. Yep. if you can actually get that person at their peak. And I think that's why I love photography. And I say it all the time of if I can capture the person at their like athletic prowess, that makes me mm -hmm. happy. You mm -hmm. know, that's why I love to do what I love to do. And even though it's like a small thing of somebody going like, hey, thank you, like that really is, it just makes it worth it at the end of the day. Because if you've made their day, right. like if you made them look cool, right, right or famous, yep. that you, you get enjoyment out of that. Exactly. Yeah, that's cool. So what are some things, so, you know, we have some, some listeners, some members, some people that like photography. So mm -hmm. what would you tell someone who's like, yeah, I'm at, I join, I am at a gym. Um, the owner asked me to take some pictures. Yep. Like, what would be some of your advice to that person? Uh, basic action photography stuff. Don't shoot eye level, almost ever. Um, there are a few lifts that we do that, like, you have to, otherwise you're not going to see anything. Mm. But get high, and that, by that I mean, like, go to the top of the Yeah, so the you're famous bar. for yeah. <laughs> uh, being on the pull-up rig. Yep. Like, not just hanging from, but, like, literally on, on top, top of it. sitting on top of a pull-up bar. Right. Yeah. I, uh, I'm a little Peter Parker in that way. Yeah. Of, like, if you tell me I can climb <laughs> something, I can generally do it. Yeah. Um, and of course that's a little different when you have thousands of dollars of stuff on your back, mm -hmm, but, uh, mm -hmm. no, nah, it hasn't fallen yet. So we're okay. Yeah. Fingers crossed. But, uh, yeah, definitely get high, shoot low, um, make things different, make things interesting and just enjoy it. Like you're, it's really difficult to shoot. Mm -hmm. Um, and just keep shooting as with anything else, you know, you just keep doing it and you'll find what you like. Talk to people. Um, mm -hmm. I love handing my camera off to somebody. Maybe that's never even shot. Cause even if it's not great, they'll do it differently than I do. And you're mm -hmm. like, wow, like mm -hmm. I never would have thought of that. And yeah. that's why I think photographers are really cool most at least that mm -hmm. they actually will go and talk shop yep you know it's not yep. one of those fields that people are generally they don't try and hide their spot in most mm -hmm. cases mm -hmm. um, and that's a good thing yeah well usually and yeah. especially in that field they've learned from someone else right right so like there is a kind of a, a natural mentor mentee type yep. structure as formal or as not as people want but right. Generally, it's not someone just picking up a camera and just learning all by themselves, yep. right? Um, maybe now with YouTube, that could be, <laughs> but it's still yeah. someone who is out there putting out information so that people can shortcut. Right. Um, so, what, so what gear do you shoot with? What do you like to shoot with, especially inside? Uh, my 85 millimeter 1.4 is a monster. I don't shoot it at f1.4, if anybody doesn't understand camera stuff. Um, is it an icon? It's an icon. Mm -hmm. Um, D850 is my primary one that I like to use in the gym. I have a D4S, but its quality is not as great, especially at higher ISOs. Mm -hmm. ISO is like the grainage of the film, mm -hmm. AKA the higher the grainage, the faster we can shoot. The problem with that is that then it looks like somebody put an Instagram filter on it, even though it's mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. So um, great for outdoors, 
right? Correct. But especially um, for the frame rate. Right. Yeah. Oh my, it's like 11 frames a second. So yeah. that's also tedious when I'm in the gym and take 700 photos <laughs> instead of 250. Um, but the D850, the file sizes are awesome too. So I can use that fixed lens and shoot it and then actually crop it and it's still, you know, yeah. seven. Still megabyte. huge, yeah, big enough. Still, right. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, just the f-stop. You generally don't want to shoot anything below 1.8. Um, it's just too low of a depth of field, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but yeah, cool. I, this is all, you know, shop stuff, but you know, I have yeah. a 70 to 200, um, the 14 to 24 fisheye F2.8 is awesome. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but you know, you're getting everything in that frame. Yep. Yeah. So. You definitely have to know how to use it. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that one's awesome. If you actually get to the top of a rafter and like somebody's doing like a clean and jerk mm -hmm. and you can just shoot down and like the, the weight's all distorted and mm -hmm. it just looks awesome. Yep. That, and if you're trying to take a picture of a dog or a kid, <laughs> like you can't beat a fish eye lens. <laughs> so. Especially a dog coming up right on you. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. You just get a big old slobbery kiss in the lens and the owner's always apologetic. It's like, it's fine. I, you, you know, I got wipes. Yep. So. What's the, uh, what's the deal with Spider-Man? Because you, you like to dress up as Spider-Man. <laughs> and is, is that something from when you were a kid? Uh, or w like when did that come about? Because you're so, relatively famous for that. <laughs> That's true. I think, uh, did you take that photo of me jumping over the barrier for Wolverine? I, d I don't know if it was me, but I, I know what t you're okay. talking about, yeah, what photo you're talking was... about. It might have been me if you obviously weren't behind the camera. But yep. it, um, at some point, I... you tend to dress up as Spider-Man. Right. <laughs> so yeah, it was just a morph suit. And I was just like, I could fit in that. You know, mm -hmm. I was still much skinnier at that point. Um, I don't know if I'd fit nearly the Peter Parker <laughs> small boy body build anymore. But uh, um, yeah, I, I just enjoyed dressing up as Spider-Man and it's a good time. Uh, I worked at a summer camp. This is the first year I haven't been able to do it. Mm. Uh, but for 13 years, I worked at a summer camp mm -hmm. and uh, we would have a superhero day. And mm -hmm. that was always awesome because as a photographer, I don't really get to work with the kids all that often, but you right. dress up as Spider-Man and you're every three-year-old's best friend for sure so for sure um it's tough to convince them that like you can't just shoot everything you're with your webs because they don't understand that you're in costume right um, right but yeah no this the spider-man thing's fun and he fits the crossfit world yep. relatively well yeah a little so, quirky little yeah a little, little quirky fun, right? you know a smaller dude who could lift a lot more than you think he can you know that's pretty yep. pretty basic for a lot of us so let's yeah let's go back to uh the fitness side so yep. you started this was in college because yep. your buddy started Panther CrossFit. Yep. And I think I might have either met him or maybe competed with him or against him at sectionals. Yeah, um, there were a few of them. Because they were held at KOP at least. Uh -huh. And that's how I found KOP actually. Okay, yeah. So that, I think that's kind of how, I don't think we connected at sectionals, but I think later on right. we you came back. Building. Yep. And either we had met you know, that particular weekend of sectionals, but then later on you came back in and actually joined. Yep. Um, but that's where, man, it was like every region was just kind of like a free for all. It like was awesome. Sectionals, man. you, I think it was PA, Ohio. Uh, oh no, the sectional was PA, maybe New Jersey, Delaware. Um, but then the regional, you would, whoever won the sectional went on out to Ohio yep. in the middle of nowhere in the field. And so, but every sectional, every regional just programmed their own workouts. Unlike now where it's very standardized. Um, because the idea was that no matter what the workouts were, the, the fittest would come out on top, right. the cream would rise to the top, right? So um, when you started, um, what did you find you were better at? What did you find was a struggle? Um, I mean, obviously, Fight Gone Bad, you actually liked it, which most people <laughs> may get totally was, scared of, right? Like, I think all of us are a little masochistic, mm -hmm. um, and I enjoyed that that aspect of like, wow, that hurt. Let's do it again, you know, for another <laughs> four rounds. So, um, yeah, the strength aspect, I, you know, I messed around in the gym with my friends, but like, I didn't really know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Um, things overhead squat to this day, like is just my favorite thing. Like, yeah. there's you've been hitting more. some PRs lately. Yeah. Right. That 200 was awesome. That's but, awesome. uh, it, there's nothing more badass to me than like throwing weight over your head and then just going like, I can squat this now. Yep. Um, and I think my karate base, especially like my, uh, you know, whether we're talking just front stance or anything mm -hmm. like that, like generally speaking, your legs and your lower gotcha. mm -hmm. area is going to mm -hmm. be a little stronger. Yep. Um, yeah, that's uh, you feel like your mobility is from that as well. For sure. Yeah. Like my toes to bar are kind of weird. It's almost it, like it is a front kick to a degree. Mm. Um, but that's, I will say this though, our, uh, our front stance, you generally track your back foot out. 
And whenever I try and do a split jerk, I can, mm. once it starts getting heavy, that back foot for me pops out to the side. And Steph gets a meal. Shoot, laterally, yep. so it goes out, okay. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Um, and so That's then funny. my hips will turn, yep. and then the weight gets weight. weird, and yep. then I yep. have to drop it. Um, yeah, because you want to remain square as right. much as you can. Yeah. And just like anything in CrossFit, if I stopped you know, doing that and actually focused on getting better at that for a month or two, it would probably get fixed. But it's one of those things that I only do ever so often. So right, right. You, can get, you can only get so annoyed at it until yep. you have to sit yourself down and just go like, this is your fault. Yep. You know, you can, uh, <laughs> you can fix this if you want to, but. Yep. So let's talk about, um, let, well, yeah, let's actually dive into addiction, which okay. um, we knew that we were coming in here to talk about, but obviously anyone listening to this might not realize. We've had a history of addiction, yep. uh, alcohol for the yep. most part. Hundred percent alcohol. So, <laughs> um, when when did this start? When did you notice things? Um, uh, yeah, I guess talk about kind of the origins of this side of you. Um, I'll say like it's in my blood. I think a lot of this you kind of go back to, you know, not my family environment's amazing. My parents are awesome. It's it's not like. I was depressed because of that. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of addiction issues do stem from missing something. And for me, it was, whether it was depression of still living at home still, but also combined with the genetic, you know, issues. Mm -hmm. um, there's just a certain population of the, <laughs> of the world that just uh, something clicks and, you know, that, um, substance of choice is there a family history there specifically is. with alcoholism yep yeah okay. um i mean pretty much all my grandmother my on my mom's side you know mm -hmm. will put ice cubes in her glass of wine that she'll drink once a year and she's uh the only one of my grandparents who are still around so maybe that says something gotcha um but yeah like it's it's all prevalent mm -hmm. throughout my family and luckily i'm the only one at this point of mm -hmm. my family who has been flagged as the you have a problem you can't partake in this anymore do you have siblings um, i do i have a younger sister yeah um, and she has never showed any signs of it, which is great. Mm. Uh, it's not something I'd ever wish for anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as drinking, it's not like I was getting DUIs, you know? Like right. it wasn't, I didn't over partake going out with friends. I hit it really well. The one thing you'll find with addicts is that we are the, not necessarily liars, because that comes from trying to hide the issue. Like people with addiction, generally speaking, know that they have an issue. Like mm -hmm. whether we're talking ruining family dynamics or ruining other parts of your life. Like I was probably spending $20 a day at minimum on alcohol. Mm. So we're talking like the amount of money that I wasted for, mm -hmm. I'd say, so I got clean a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say probably the last like five years before that was really where I had an issue. Mm -hmm. And there were ups and downs where like I would get in a fight with my family from being too drunk at a holiday party mm -hmm. and then I'd stop for a week or two and then we would slowly get back to there. But it is a progressive disease. And that's one thing that nobody wants to hear. Um, but it is a disease and you gotta- They don't wanna hear it. because they don't wanna feel, they don't wanna admit that they're what they have always heard about. Yep. But and don't wanna identify with. Yep, and yeah. there's a stigma and that's part of the reason do you want me to go into like really where as my... much as much as you're comfortable with, okay. you know, I'm... part, part of why we're talking is because right. yeah, like a year and a half ago. Well, yeah, probably a year and a half ago. There was this Facebook post yep. where you did a clean a squat clean. And I think it was 200 pounds. Yep. Um, your previous PR was 155. Yep. And you wrote about, yes, 45 pound jump is great, especially after doing like eight or so years of CrossFit. Yep when you know, normally that far in, you don't make jumps like that. No, not at all. Um, and so uh, you wrote that, yes, the jump in of itself is nice, but hey, here's what I've been dealing with these last years. And I, you know, I think a lot of people didn't even know this about you. And yep. so there's this response of, oh my God, like we've known Ryan for years and uh, you know, obviously he's, he's been you know, kind of masking it better than maybe we would have yeah, ever caught on to. So, you know, <laughs> part of why that. I want to talk about this is I, I have to imagine there are people out there, either they themselves or their family members or friends that are dealing with a, not only similar, but the, these, this situation. Yeah. And so talk about as much as you want, because, mm -hmm. you know, the more people can learn, the better. Um, it's such a tough 
Because there's so many people that struggle with the mental instability that kind of sets you to that. Yes, there is a genetic, as I kind of touched on, issue with it. But it is so sneaky, and it can happen to anyone. Um, and you just, even if there's signs there, it's tough because you're so defensive about it. Nobody wants to sit in a group and be like, hi, I'm Ryan, and I'm, I'm an alcoholic. Like, even to this day mm -hmm. that I've known it, it mm -hmm. I don't love saying those words, mm -hmm. despite the fact that I've taken ownership of that. And that's a big, they say it's the first step of admitting that you have a problem. And mm -hmm. that is so difficult to do. And really, there's no other way to get yourself better into A, admitting that you have a problem. It has taken everything that you love and made you a monster to not just yourself, because a lot of it's selfish, right? Like addiction, I got to the point where I couldn't eat without having alcohol in my system. I couldn't sleep. That was particularly horrific without being, mm you know, it in my system. And I couldn't focus on anything else in my day until I got a drink in me. Mm -hmm. And you do hide it pretty well. But I remember, um, you know, obviously, you no know, Keith Bombar, uh, mm -hmm. his girlfriend, uh, Alicia, had only really known me from like a year before like I went and got help. And she, when I did come back and I got help, and I remember there was one circumstance where I was holding the phone and I was particularly like shaky like that. Uh, and she was like, oh, you shake like that too? Like it's cold in here. And I was like, yeah, totally. And just kind of like tried to hide mm -hmm, that. But mm -hmm. it was just a constant thing that I was around and I got good at hiding it, but only so much, you know, people. So your family knew? Family definitely Pretty knew. Pretty quickly or you were We all to... make excuses for it. Yeah. Um, you know, like Ryan just likes to have his drinks and mm -hmm. you know, I got mm -hmm. good at doing it. I'd stay up late at night, I still do. I'm a night owl just mm -hmm. by genetic, whatever but you're creative yeah <laughs> I, like to, I like to stay up at you're night a classic work. creative yeah. exactly stay up at night working on a computer but i that's when i would drink you know i'd wake up at one o'clock in the afternoon and you know try and expedite the amount of time where it was socially okay to get a drink in me mm -hmm. um yeah and this was after college when yes. you were home yep so um, none of this really manifested in college or no did, or, i was relatively late i mean i drank part of my college drinking was like I was roommates with all the dudes who were and hung out with all the CrossFit guys who were much bigger than me so like I could technically out drink try to keep up weight. with them but because yeah. of body weight yeah yep. okay got it and then it. Yeah. kind of what you hinted on before where I didn't have an internship right after school like I kind of made my own rules and did my own job mm -hmm. I was able to manipulate my schedule around whether or not I would go out drinking the night before play video games too late um, and drink and then all these guys who I was friends with started to have real world responsibilities and mm -hmm. I stopped. And I think that's really where one of the bigger issues and the flags for my family mm -hmm. was that I wasn't progressing. I wasn't doing anything else with my life. Like I had totally stagnated and I would, not to like deep dive into like an addict's brain, but like I would have these conversations with myself like while I was so messed up from all this, just going like, why do you keep doing your, this mm. to yourself? You know, there, there's a real world realization of like, I'm stuck here, mm -hmm. but then at some point you stop caring that you're stuck. And that's where Yeah, so you're self-aware right. of this like failure to launch yep. kind of, right? Like, I mean, you were working, but yeah. it just wasn't happening in parallel to your peers yep. who were whatever, getting into relationships or getting yep. promotions. Furthering or, their life. Further, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're talking to yourself <laughs> as, a, as a third party, basically, because yep. you know what's going on. Analyzing myself. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I beat myself up. And that's uh, like, again, there's so many different parts of, of this monster. Um, very hard on myself. Uh, I mean, any temper tantrum I throw after missing a lift or something, you'll see that. Um, but yeah, no, it just, it's a sneaky, sneaky thing, mm -hmm. addiction. And yeah, I think for me, where my family really knew was that not only was I blatantly lying to their face, but like I would say mean things that would never come out of my mouth otherwise. Mm. And it was just the monster of me trying to defend my life choices of just not caring and giving up. And it is a very slow, painful death mm -hmm. and it sucks. And mm -hmm. like, that's the one thing that I, especially like with making that post where I'm just like, look, I was there. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's so important to me and anyone else that's been through this shit to be like, it does get better, but you got to put in the work and it, there is a sameness and why a lot of people love AA is because even if our 
DOC, our drug of choice, which technically alcohol falls under. Mm -hmm. I went to rehab, uh, spent a month in St. Joe's Institute, outside of State College, fairly good experience for all things considered. Mm -hmm. But whether we're talking cocaine, uh, meth, you know, like all these, all these guys, it's still, there's such a stigma to alcohol versus drugs. It's all, all the same stuff. Mm -hmm. Like whether we're talking like low income, we all kind of boiled down to something that just wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And that was eye opening. And it was kind of nice to actually have that group that, no, it's not funny that I lied to my family or would hide alcohol bottles throughout the house so that like nobody knew just how bad it was. Mm -hmm. But it made, anytime you see someone that has your same issue, you know, it makes that issue feel real and throwing it under the rug or, or saying it's not a real thing is just so easy. And thank goodness 2020, 2021 is so much better about that. And that's mm -hmm. been nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so for rehab, yep. what was the catalyst to you? Was this a, a self? Um, no. <laughs> uh, was this an intervention? Was this a, a self admittance to it? Um, like how, how, how did you get to rehab? I, so I started working, photography had kind of fallen off a cliff. One thing you'll notice as I kind of touched on earlier is that your work will suffer and my photography was not good. Um, you know, whether photography, especially sports is such a like reactionary thing totally. that when you're that messed up and just not able to focus or your body is just not there, my work had suffered. And so I was getting less work. Mm -hmm. um, and so I took a job at FedEx working in the warehouse that's actually right down the road. Mm -hmm. um, and I had dropped from 150 pounds, which is still fairly slight, to like 138. Wow. And so I was skin and bones, drinking my life away. I could barely function without it. And my parents found me passed out in the basement of their house, just like relatively non-responsive. Wow. And so they rushed me to the hospital, pumped me with fluids, um, put me on an EKG, that was a rude awakening. And this is all fairly blurry to me still, like for better or for worse. What, and all what year was this? Of it. Uh, it was almost two years ago, uh, 2019. Got so it. it was March of 2019. Okay. Um, you know, <laughs> I, my body basically quit and could have died, mm -hmm. which is, you know, all the more scarier because yep. it is a, shitty death mm -hmm. you know nobody is just like i'm gonna drink myself into oblivion but that's what had happened and my kidneys basically weren't able to filter out anything they found i'm not gonna go into like war story because that's like one thing they warn everybody about it's not a mine is better than yours but they found a significant amount of alcohol still in my system even mm -hmm. though i didn't drink anywhere close to that because my body just couldn't filter it mm -hmm. so got me to the hospital i remember the woman that was in charge of whatever group that's in charge of this came in and like the first thing she said was oh my god it smells like a distillery in here um hmm. my dad came in they wanted to actually send me down to florida hmm. for like a super nice rehab and i was like no i'm not doing that um and then because i still lived at home you know luckily my parents loved me and my, despite all the terrible things i had said particularly to my mom i still it's still hard um Try not to talk about it, but you know everybody is in a much better place now. Mm -hmm. But um, where were your friends through this? Were they aware of what was going on? Were they trying to have conversations with you? Um, were you drinking with them, or was this mostly sometimes. a home thing? Pretty much. It, so none of them knew if I still was going out to bars. The last like five months before I got help, I had dropped off the map. But before that, I was still going out to bars pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, two or three beers, and I'd get home and I'd pound a bottle of wine. Gotcha. Um, so I was very, I just never wanted to put anybody else in danger. And that's why at the end of the day, I, I quantified it as okay. Mm -hmm. Because I was like, well, the only person I'm hurting here is me. Mm -hmm. And that's the selfish demon portion of this. But then it leaks into every other aspect of your life with the family that you're ruining. And mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they, we went on a family cruise with my immediate family and like some of my best friends. And I got because of my lack of body weight, but also where my body was there. Um, you can look at pictures of me from two years ago on that cruise, and I am a buck 40, like right, mm. right there, just skin and bones. 
and they all knew that like something was really wrong and uh, it's just hard because what are they going to say you know that they they love you but you need to get help and i wasn't ready for it and that's the saddest thing no matter who you talk to like unless you're ready to get clean it's just not going to work it's too accessible mm -hmm. especially alcohol mm -hmm. you know everybody there's a okayness with drinking too much especially now like i mean we could delve into that about my worries of the amount of people that I see that I'm like, you've developed a bad habit here that During you would have developed any other way other than yeah. staying at home. Yep. So that scares me. Um, but I've been very blessed with not just my immediate family, but all my friends being so ridiculously supportive, mm -hmm. um, whether I wanted it to or not. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, then CrossFit, like coming in and like one of the... <laughs> The doctors, particularly at St. Joe's, were amazed because they were like, they take like a, when you get in there, they take like a basic of your body as far as like what you're capable of. Within like a week, I was like back to like normal good health. And they were like, that's absurd. Like people don't Got rebound yeah. like you. Mm -hmm. And it was because mm -hmm. for the most part, I was still doing CrossFit mm -hmm. even once or twice a week. Mm -hmm. But the wellness spectrum that we talk about, like mm -hmm. that's definitely a thing. I'm not saying don't test it. Yeah. But uh, I'm not saying test it. Right. But. That was, uh, I definitely think CrossFit saved my life in that regard. And it definitely has kept me out of trouble when I came back. So this is interesting because there's a lot of people with um, a history of addiction who, um, you know, there's lots of different spectrums of it. But, you know, for the most part, there's a lot of stories where they, you know, get, go into rehab or, and then come out and then they start CrossFit. Yep. Uh, or something to that effect, where basically exercise is that now their new addiction, right? Yep. And you and you have you know games level athletes because they're willing to put six hours of work every day into working out because all of a sudden, you know, they're redirecting their energy towards this versus you know whatever yep. other vice they were. They Frazier's were. one of us. <laughs> exactly. So, yep. He's been sober um, for what, like five years or so, right? Yeah. Um, I, I, something maybe like that. I think he he had issues when he was like 16, 17, so he figured it out pretty early. Yep. He um, was super young. Yep. Right. But he. Yeah, I mean, he hit that same realization of like, this isn't what I want. And then, yeah, like we all have addictive personalities. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of the things, particularly when I got out of rehab, but I was still going to group type stuff. They mm -hmm. were very worried about me going in and blowing out a shoulder or something. Um, mm -hmm. Luckily, Amy and everybody else, not just new, but like, we're like, let's take it easy until like, you get back to like <laughs> yeah, a- Yeah, let's hold you back better, a little bit. It's easy back yeah, in. Yeah, better level. Right. Um, but yeah, those gains, you know, they hit quick. Like once you stop fueling yourself with poison in my body, you're like, oh, I like this. Like, give me the food. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's still to this day, like my body is just a completely different animal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with COVID, I've eat, eaten way too much pizza and other <laughs> fun stuff. Like definitely not saying my diet's anything to follow. But, sure, sure. Um, comparatively, like it's just cool being strong and it's fulfilling to actually have something that's positive to do every single day. Yep. And I know that's been a key portion of my life of going there four to five days a week mm -hmm. um, and just having a safe space. So w can you pinpoint w what you were either looking for or avoiding or in terms of drinking? And yep. then what was it that like, was it rehab? And if it, if it was rehab, like, what did you learn there that you realized, no, I, I don't have to be drinking to X, run away from this, or, right. you know, whatever? For me, it was self-medication of depression. Mm -hmm. um, I know my feelings. I'm a little bit too well in tune with them. And so drinking for me was a way to get myself to shut up. Gotcha. Despite those late night conversations with myself. Yeah, yeah. it just, it mm -hmm. made it seem like, screw it, I don't care. Mm -hmm. Uh, rehab, I mean, you get clean, you're around of other people or a lot of other people. I hated the fact that they were like regulating my schedule because I'm a fairly independent person like yep. that. Yep. Um, but I think it, you finally, you get clean and you get hungry. It takes a few days. Um, but yeah, once you start feeling more normal and like that was another shitty part too, just knowing that I needed it to function, mm -hmm. being trapped by something, you know, being handcuffed by something every single day of your life, whether it's the money aspect, but also just knowing that's all that you cared about. Mm -hmm. Like you're not going to get other nice things if that's the thing that comes to the front. Mm -hmm. And that's just what I lived with for so many years and you defend it and you hide it, but it, 
it is what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so you come out and you, it sounds like you, you went to working out more frequently in bit. order to kind of keep a better yeah. schedule and yep. have something to look forward to. Yep. Um, do you think if you were able to talk to yourself, let's say three years ago, four years ago, whatever, uh, that you could have convinced yourself back no. then to nope. change? I don't because I think that near death situation of like waking up with an EKG on you um, scared the shit out of me as it should, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah. you got to hit that rock mm -hmm. before you could really be happy with yourself again mm. and just acknowledge that this is who you are. And it, it's not, it sucks. Like only 10% of the population even has to potentially have this issue. Mm. But I can't tell you how many times that I was like, why can't I stop? Why is it always a game mm -hmm. to see how much I could put in my system? Mm -hmm. Because there just isn't, there's no yellow light in, in my addictive brain like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's luckily, all, or, all or nothing, right? Right, yeah. and that's just where you are. And it's degenerative too, because you, once you start and your brain makes those neural pathways, that was another cool thing. Like you actually do learn a good amount of science in rehab, at least the one that I went to. <laughs> Just bring it in full circle back right? to the science, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the thing that I failed out of in college. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just as soon as you make those neural pathways, they're like, it's degenerative. Like as soon as you go back to drinking more, it's gonna be just as bad and then be worse. And so that's, mm. it might be a scare tactic, but it's true. But it worked yeah. for you. Yeah. And it, especially talking to people that have relapsed. Mm -hmm. um, I am not a great example of somebody who needs the AA program. I Got it. have some strong, disagreements with the way that they do certain things. Mm -hmm. I think it's great. And mm -hmm. I think that everybody in recovery needs a community. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't the community for me. What well, I, you already had one. Right. And that's kind of right through CrossFit. Yep. Through yeah. CrossFit. And it's as long as you're like open about your issues. And I think CrossFit's great about that too, because it is a family. Like mm -hmm. it's a chosen, it's more of a fraternity. Yep. Um, yep. But as soon as you actually open up and you talk to them about how you feel like I don't know anybody who's worth having in your gym that would ever scoff at mm -hmm. what I went through. Right. Um, and it's just supportive and I, I love that about it. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's a bitter, bitter pill to swallow, but like as soon as you're like, this is bigger than me and I need help, mm -hmm. then that's really where CrossFit comes in and it's great. And you could even consider addiction, whether we're talking about like bad dietary habits or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's all part of the same the same realm, obviously, yep. with different degrees of seriousness. But. Now, when you came out more public with this, yep. um, whether it was that Facebook post or just in talking with people, do you get people coming to you and being like, I do. yes, I have struggled with this personally, or yep. I have a you know, family member? Or... I do, and it's great. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's dangerous to a degree because I do not have an MD in this. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you this is a problem. You need to go see help. Mm -hmm. What I can say are these are the signs that I know particularly uh, needing it to sleep is a huge one. Mm. Anytime that you think, should I pump the brakes? Just do it. Yeah. It's not a problem um, until it becomes a problem. And that's where the neuropathway stuff comes back in where like if you become dependent on it, you're stuck. And that's Maybe not the three years before, but had we, I talked to myself a decade before, mm. you know, then yeah, maybe. Right. So what would be some of those messages, right? Because again, I imagine there are people where they're in all different stages, yep. right? And maybe they are in those super, super early stages where maybe something you say could, could change, right? So what, what would you say? Yeah, I would uh, look around you. Like it, if the things that you continue to do are hurting everybody else around you, then that's really where you need to, to ask. How you make other people feel is a really big thing to ask, period, but also especially with addiction issues because people don't know how to confront you about it. Mm -hmm. They're so afraid, and for me, I would storm off, especially at those later stages, but like mm -hmm. nobody wants to admit that you have a problem. Mm -hmm. So if you do feel like you have that problem, just go seek out help. It's not an issue to go and see therapy and it's, getting unstigmatized, which is great. Yes, yep. Um, but yeah, just actually getting out there and, and just looking around. Um, it's not a problem to go to an AA meeting. You know, it's a pretty welcoming, albeit different community, but mm -hmm. like it's, it's still a good place. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, 
as far would as... Would you recommend uh, if someone doesn't have a community to right. go to, to find one? Yes, for sure. Yeah. I think everybody needs a place to belong. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, don't really know any, any <laughs> other. Like, humans are communal species. Yeah. So... It's not going to be detrimental, right? No. If anything, hurt. you know, it might be incremental benefit. Right. More often than not, there's probably a huge benefit to finding some sort of community. It doesn't have to be cross it. It doesn't have to be working out. Right. That could be a book club. Could yep. be a knitting club. Could be, you know, pickleball. Like whatever. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And yeah, just being active too. I think is a big aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, I know with COVID, you know, I've seen a lot of people develop some bad habits. And maybe that's where like we're kind of sort of talking about like people that are starting to to feel like, oh, should I pump the brakes here? I know dry January gotcha. was a pretty big thing. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's a great idea. Yep. But. Cool. What are, uh, looking forward, so 2020, we're in 2021, yep. beginning of, vaccine is getting rolled out. Um, right now, winter, but it will soon be warmer weather. So what are you looking forward to, whether it's 2021 or even beyond? Uh, moving on with my life, I mean, uh, <laughs> They tell you not to date out of rehab. It just so happened that I kind of sort of broke that rule. Uh, <laughs> my girlfriend is a lovely human being. We're moving in together soon with our dog, my dog, but now ours. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's definitely something I'm looking forward to. Cool. I think just no more normalcy, but also understanding how good we have it is important for all of us at this point. Mm. Um, whether it's like having a nice dinner with your family that we didn't have for so long or mm-hmm communicating with your neighbor to, to check in if they're okay. I think humanity as a whole has become a lot more connected and realized just how important it is to, to make sure everybody else is okay around you. So that's of all the things that have like come out of the cluster mm-hmm. that is 2020. I think that's right. the best one. Yeah. I mean, obviously no one would want COVID to happen, um, but the silver linings of it, you know, are people are needing to connect with their family and their close loved ones, yep. even more so, right? And then those who they don't see as often, you you basically have to like search for and figure out like who you want to keep in touch with and right. and make it happen in some way, shape, or form, yep. right? Um, and so throughout all of this, I think a lot of people are figuring out what's actually important to them, yep. right? Versus just especially for the people who maybe travel for work and they're always on the go and they're always just yep. moving from one thing to the next. Um, being at home uh, is different for a lot of people, right? And yep. so what that does is it gives space for people to be thinking about what it is they either want, what they enjoy doing, what's important to them. Um, so now some of it is somewhat restricted if like things are shut down and, and whatnot, <laughs> but yeah. you know, if you really want to make something happen, you're going to make it happen. Right. You know? So, yeah. Cool. Anything else you want to share? Not off the top of my head. Cool, man. Well, thanks for your time. Yeah, of course. Appreciate it. Appreciate your story. Pleasure. You guys have been great. Please listen carefully.